So from the audience, who'd like to ask the first question to the panel? <laughs> thank you, Lawrence. Well, thanks for, for all the presentation. It's very interesting. I, I have a two, two comment and question. Uh, the first one is, is uh, with Bonnie, when you speak about the role of neg false negative patient. This is also an ongoing discussion with sleeping sickness. It's with the current tools. We know that we cannot detect all the patients, and then they, they, they are infected, and, and they play a role in the transmission, or we don't know which role they can play in the transmission. And then the, the second one is Tomo Chagas. I'm, I'm very happy uh, to have seen this presentation, because I think, um, especially from MSF side, we, we claim since years that uh, presentation, uh, outcome of, of new uh, or evolution of technology uh, is not visible. And I think the, the main comments will be how to make this kind of initiative integrated in a very close environment when we speak about neglected disease, yeah. which is generally only Thank you for that. Some you know, huge points made there. In terms of making that type of initiative more visible, I'd like to ask the panel. I mean, from your perspective, you know, Simone, from your perspective, if you don't mind me asking first, how do we make something like this happen? How do you make it more visible? Yes, I think, um, for example, in regard to Chagas disease, it's really a problem. I think the, the numbers are wrong and everything is underestimated. The reason is why is this? Because to my opinion, uh, statistics is not in every country the same, you know. Um, I worked um, quite a while in, in Colombia and in other countries, and how does it work there? How do they do statistics? For example, in, in uh, um, CHAM diseases, when we did the study of fever of unknown origin, the statistics was done by an epidemiologist getting the diagnosis from the doctor. The diagnosis was fever. so. And um, he has no other tools to, to declare what the fever is. So the epidemiologist gets the data and says, well, fever today, I think it's typhus, and tomorrow it's dengue. Oh, it's politically wanted that dengue goes up, mm -hmm. so he claims all fevers to be a dengue, and he is not a doctor. And that is often the way they do statistics, yeah, due to a lack of, of diagnostic tools, and then, but also because they don't know what they have to do. Mm -hmm. It's not that they have not the ability and they know what they are doing, but it's just how, how numbers um, yeah. are created and that is also a big problem, right? And what can I do? Now I have a new technique and that's the reason why I'm here. I'm presenting it to you and I hope for cooperations and for help to get this also on the market. But as a matter of fact, I also must say I have offered this, for example, to a German company and they said to me, you know, we, we are going to launch it, but only if you, number one, don't publish it, number two, keep it a secret, and number three, don't sell to anybody else. And I said, no, look, that is not what I have invented this for. Yeah, it's for the poor people, it's for the broad spectrum of, of population. Mm -hmm. It's not for some people, you know, who want to make a big uh, effort with it. So, so it's not only for the rich ones, they can afford anyway, but it's, it's for the population who's suffering. So I refused this and I hope, uh, it was not a mistake, mistake. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't feel like, um, exactly. but uh, yeah. I hope that you can give me a hand to bring it really to the people in need. Well, if that wasn't a call for action, I, I don't know. That was a call, yeah, for was a <laughs> call for action. Um, Bonnie, I'd like to ask you the same question. Is that what can be done in terms of increasing visibility for innovation and, and you know, 
from your perspective, from someone who's at the NHM, wouldn't the public wouldn't normally know that you're involved in something as complex as, as, the, as your presentation, um, and also the potential impact of it. So, what would be the kind of um, you know channel or the kind of um, how would you develop or increase visibility? I suppose cause I come I come in for a very different um, background, um, and so I'm very interested in science and I, I'm interested in what's needed. But I haven't I don't know anything about commercialisation or any of those kind of factors. Um, and I just want to produce a, something that works and and is a good need. Um, uh, you know, to people it's it's when there's commercial companies and you, you're thinking about how much they're asking for to kind of develop your methods well. And, I don't know where to start with that kind mm. of thing. So, um, I mean, I could ask the, that question to perhaps Jim, because you've been through that cycle of idea, innovate, you know, pushing it into the into where you are now with it. What would be your advice? You can't do it by yourself. You have to find a partner. That's the one thing I've learned. I can't even count on Merck all the time. I have to go outside Merck to find money, and I do it. Um, once you have a product and you know it works, uh, the next thing you have to do is choose what platform you want to put it on. But when it comes time to commercialize and get the word out, um, there's three big networks that, that I use. Uh, I use uh, uh, social media, uh, particularly LinkedIn. Uh, right now I have uh, close to 10,000 laboratorians worldwide that uh, follow my updates on LinkedIn. Um, the second thing I do to get the word out is, uh, is uh, I attend uh, meetings. If you want to work with uh, ministers of health in developing countries, like it or not, the only organized method to get to them is through the AIDS community. And so I have worked on co-infections with AIDS because I know if I go to the IAS meetings in uh, Paris this year, or in Amsterdam next year, I'll see every Minister of Health from Africa, from South America, and from Southeast Asia there. And uh, I'll have meetings, if I have a booth, they'll come to my booth. If not, at least they'll listen to my presentation. So that's a key way to get the word out. Um, one of the processes that you have to go through to get uh, the United Nations to pay for your testing uh, is uh, the World Health Organization. And so the earlier you contact them uh, with your product and, and talk to them and get it pre-qualified, the faster you're gonna get that product to market. And just like the lady at the end of the table here, they're very, very concerned about not gouging customers. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a funny thing, but I think everybody that uh, builds these products should go to the developing country where they intend to sell it and take a look at their customers and then uh, make the decisions that they make. Um, the final uh, way to get the word out uh, is to go to uh, meetings uh, for tropical medicine, uh, the biggest one being the one in the U.S., uh, the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Um, that's very well internationally attended, and uh, uh, the presentations cover all sorts of neglected tropical diseases. It used to be known as a malaria meeting, but uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's really diversified now. And there's a lot of talk about Shisto and Anko and all sorts of things out there. So I highly recommend that. Um, if you can work with a partner like Merck, um, they can help you with both technical feasibility and financial feasibility so that uh, you can put together your strategies. And uh, I, I know uh, a lot of people are shy about talking to big companies, but uh, big companies were once small companies and they were all entrepreneurs at one time. And uh, I've had a great career uh, taken small companies to big companies and haven't been companies by them. So uh, it can happen. Thank you for that, Jim. I mean, I'd like to kind of, you've heard Merck's perspective on it. I mean, I'd like to hear Janssen Diagnostics' perspective on it as well, simply because you're working in SDH. 
um, Rita's work on challenging the orthodoxy of Kato Katz as an example. Um, what's your view on that in terms of bringing innovation into, into the way that you, you work from a partnership perspective? Ole, <laughs> yeah, sorry to put you on the spot, but why not? I think it's exactly the same as we mentioned this morning as well. We need to collaborate, uh, and I think Jim is also referring to that. We cannot do it by ourselves as big companies. Uh, we need to have the field expertise, we need to have technical expertise, which we do not always have in-house. We need to work together with all the players in the field, uh, work together with the same ambition and the same aspiration. This is bringing that solution to the field. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I wanted to ask a, a different type of question in terms of the evolution of these partnerships and these collaborations. Sorry, Benny, did you want to add something? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't see your hand there. Yeah. Yes, I want to add something. Benny Barton from the answer as well. I'm a, I agree, first of all, with my colleague, and not only because he's my colleague. <laughs> but uh, I was a bit surprised by what Dr. Khan said about the company telling you, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, because I think that thinking is very old-fashioned thinking in this perspective. I mean, if that was, I think that's very much old school, where you say, yes, we like to collaborate with you, but it's ours as of now, don't publish, keep it a secret, this is us, 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 I read the IP, and et cetera, et cetera. That used to be the case, I think, in the field, but we're discussing here today, that doesn't work anymore. So I think that's, that's it's very much open and sharing, and uh, even if, like us, we've stopped for Venezuela and obviously in Autosirca, uh, all the diagnostic data will be made yeah. so that people can build them. It's not ours. I think it's we all have the same objective, and it is to help those in need and, and forward the field. And uh, so I, I hope they change their mind sometime, even though I probably <laughs> think that you probably won't go back to them. No, I will not. <laughs> no, I will not. That is not what I want, you know. Thank you for that. I mean, I wanted to ask something in relation to the evolving nature of partnerships, and one of the points was, that was raised yesterday um, was this kind of movement, I guess, towards, as you enter the elimination phase, of bringing on board um, something to augment the MDA, and that would be a vaccine for that particular disease. Right? So we saw that with the schisto yesterday, um, as well as onco psychiasis and a few other settings. So I wanted to ask, if that does start to happen, if we did start seeing co-treatment, and I've certainly heard it from Peter Hotez in terms of Shagas and the vaccine that they're working on in the States. So Ben's Nidazol is probably going to be licensed this year for Chagas, um, fingers crossed, um, in the US. <clears throat> but they're also working on the vaccine at Baylor. And so, <clears throat> sorry, they're already starting <clears throat> sorry, um, studies looking at the effect on patients of, of both treatments together. So given that type of evolution in the landscape, how would you anticipate the positioning of diagnostics and then the evolution of the potential partnerships? And I'd like to ask that to Stefan, because you've got a new kind of um, approach to it that can touch into the vaccine world as well in terms of your glycan, um, the carbohydrate approach, as well as other settings. So given that that's an evolution, co-treatment, vaccines and MDA, how does that change the positioning of the diagnostics offering as well as the anticipated evolution in terms of partnership? <clears throat> well, I have to say um, we are presently in a, in a very early stage, so for us, um, for us personally, what we are looking for is um, definitely uh, partnering as such. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, how will it change that partnering? Will you be going more? Will the pendulum be towards the the vaccine world, or will it be towards the, you know, how how do you anticipate that change? Well, it's actually I would say it's it's going more into in the vaccination world um, mm -hmm. because that's what I see as the biggest impact mm -hmm. um, because it can actually help people um, straight away. Mm -hmm. um, definitely, diagnostics is important, but from from a personal perspective, me personally, I would definitely more go towards vaccination. Okay. Interesting. From the audience, any uh, additional questions in terms of input into that? Blaine Doyle from LODX. I'm just wondering, I suppose, mainly maybe towards Jim, I just want to kind of get your, your uh, ideas around the, if open source could ever fit into working with a, a multinational company. 
particularly for, for the situation that Simone is in, um, is there any way that you think that could actually, you know, both sides, I suppose, and both ambitions could be balanced there? Yes. Uh, I'll talk to Simone uh, privately, but uh, there's, uh, I'm approached all the time. And, uh, you know, I, I take the time and I read about it and I go and I meet with the, the, the scientists in these places and I sit down with them. Um, and then I do my homework. Uh, I take a look and I see if there's uh, the ability to do it technically with the platforms that I have available or will be a cost to develop a new platform. I try and identify the, the, the qualities I need if it's a new pro product uh, to, to be successful. Um, and then I do uh, uh, a financial feasibility, what would be my cost to, to do it. And then I take it back to the partner and I open up myself with a spreadsheet in front of them. And I sit down and I say, if you were gonna contract with me, I want a completely honest relationship. And uh, uh, so you'll know what my spending is and how much investment I have to get. I'll tell you how much Merck can give me and where I can get outside funding. And uh, I'll ask you to team with me and, uh, and, and work through it. Uh, the uh, feasibility part of it is probably the hardest part because once I get that, then I have to do an internal review with our accountants and our managers. And uh, sometimes that's a tougher sell than, than uh, trying to sell it to the United Nations, okay? <laughs> uh, but uh, often uh, for every nine or 10 rejections, I get one that works. And uh, then it goes into uh, getting it financed and uh, I go the, through the motions there. Um, so that the whole process can take uh, six months to a year. And then once you've got to go, it's anywhere from uh, a year and a half to two years to develop the product. And then the regulatory process now takes two years. It, uh, we just got hit with a whole new layer of regulatory. It's, it's amazing, they don't have anything else to do. <laughs> I'm a champion, by the way, and if you talk to any UN representative, tell them we want one world regulatory. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, uh, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So we're talking about innovation and we're talking about solutions, pathways to innovation. So questions from the audience. <clears throat> well, one of the areas that we touched upon earlier in the day was the lack of samples, lack of, you know, biobanks or, um, you know, access to those kind of... Um, That's tough. Bio samples, exactly. And, and some of the issues raised by Bonnie were pooled, pooled um, sample, uh, a strategy around pooled resource for sample. How would that work? Bonnie, could I, what's your view on how would that work? You had it on one of your slides. I think it's a very fair point. Yeah, well, if that, the pooling sample strategy is mainly to reduce costs so that it, when you're working in very low prevalence areas and you're screening, you know, um, one out of ten are going to be positive and you can pull ten samples and then, then yeah, you have to go back um, to look at them individually if you've got the positive. That's really a reducing costs yeah. um, at, at that level. But it, it'll only, that, that can only be done at a certain level. Yeah, I mean, from, from a structural perspective, how would it, how would it look? I mean, I'll ask that to Simone, um, because you spent so much time out in, in, in the field, 3,000 samples of indigenous people. We saw some of the roads you were taking to get to those places, <laughs> unbelievable. It was an adventure. <laughs> how, would a structure, how would it look structurally? Who would be in charge of that? We're essentially talking about a biobank, mm -hmm. right? But who would be, you know, how would you, what's your ideal situation on that? A pooled resource. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, for Chagas disease, it's important. Uh, it's difficult to pool the samples, yeah, because um, as I, I demonstrated, there's a high prevalence in the region, and you really need to know who is the person who mm. suffers from Chagas disease. Um, so a pooling um, would not be appropriate, mm. because if, if you make the indication for a therapy, the person goes in a two or three months treatment, and also the medication has a lot of side effects, and that, that is not funny. Mm. <laughs> so. Um, the pooling could be true for screening purposes, but as soon as you have, I mean, you really have to find uh, the distinct person who is suffering from it yeah. um, to cure it, right? Okay. 
Okay. I mean, c coming out of the acute focus of yeah. Chagas for a second, would there be like a general structure? Who, who would be in charge of the biobank? Is it the academics? Is it the country? Is it the, you know, who, who needs to broker that? I think it should be a collaboration of all oh, of the a, parties. Yeah. Yeah. A collaboration, yeah. yeah. There's a question there. Um, I'm Fiona Allen from the Natural History Museum as well, um, and I work on the SCAN project, which is looking at the genetics of the Mouse's collections of the Natural History Museum. So in terms of pooled resources, we're a global repository and take yeah. samples from different projects, different um, endemic countries, of any just so related materials. Yeah. So that could be worms from animal passage, larval samples from humans, from snails, the snails themselves. Um, and so with that, then we're a resource for researchers, particularly in this sort of post or, you know, as the genomes develop, as there's thoughts of drug resistance, etc. There's a massive resource there. Yeah. And in that way, then there's a pooled resource oh. for the research community to use for shift. I mean, I know you're, you're speaking later, Fiona, in the, in yeah. the One Health session, we're looking forward to that, and we're very aware of the SCAN project from our previous dealings with Professor Wallinson, who's here as well. Um, is it a question of communication? getting that out to people, that here is an actual resource, you should use it, you should add to it. Yes, no, absolutely, and it's something that we're, we're trying to do and developing, like um, they were saying before about going to meetings and making sure people are aware of you. Yeah. Um, on top of that, um, yeah, so there is that awareness, but it's also trying to get people, uh, trying to look at what people need as well from us. So in terms of are there specific questions um, that need answering, um, in which case can we do more targeted sampling for more the research side probably, but mm. then there's a lot of material there for diagnostics mm. um, as well. Yeah, so. very good to, uh, to hear that. Um, I mean, moving back into the innovation part for a second, obviously there's a life cycle idea to market, if you want to call it that, there's a whole series of events in between that. Where do you think the bottleneck is? And that, that's one question. And the other question is, how do you involve the end user in terms of design? I know, Jim, yours is a, you know, miniaturized, highly appropriate for the Elmic setting, the low resource country setting, which is probably why it's taken up so well and used. Um, but I'd like to ask that question to, to, to the others in terms of, you know, how do you, wh wh firstly, where's the block in innovation, in the cycle of innovation to market? And secondly, how do you involve the end user, given that it's a resource poor setting, in the design? <laughs> if we hate me right now. Um, well, I think, what, well, from my point of view, the main block is um, funding at the beginning uh, yeah. to get the, get the everything working and all doing all the clinical trials to make sure it's good enough. Um, yeah, so that initial funding, um, and then with the end user, I mean, the way I think about a diagnostic, um, because of my background, I'm thinking about the end user before I even start. Yeah. So about what they're going to be able to do and what facilities or infrastructure they're going to have. And that's, that's what I think about before I even yeah. start with the diagnostic. You go through the appropriate lens, yeah. Okay. Rita, from your perspective, from a methodology perspective or a lab perspective? Um, I can only talk about the academic perspective. Yeah. It's the only one I have. <laughs> um, I think it, it, it definitely depends on the funding. Oh. Um, and it also depends on uh, the kind of collaborators we have. Mm -hmm. um, if you think of the end user as the patient that yeah. you're trying to diagnose, um, I, I think it depends quite heavily on um, who is running which kind of studies in, yeah. in which places. Mm -hmm. um, in my case, we had um, this small study that was incorporated into the national deworming, um, school-based deworming program. Um, so we had that behind us mm. and we could access part of the population that was in being targeted by mm. the program and that's how we got to them. 
Um, but but yes, it it just depends on who your collaborators mm. in the country are and which programs you are attached uh, to. B building on that, you often hear that um, culture is the resistor to innovation. And so wherever the setting, wherever your setting is, wherever the culture is in there, embedded in the academic culture or you know, commercial culture, that can be resisted to any innovation entering into that setting. So, I mean, to end the session, we're going to break for, for coffee as well. Um, in the culture that we're in, the ecosystem, the NTD kind of, you know, the infect, this kind of ecosystem that we're in, in one word, going through the panel, what, what's the resistor to innovation? And I'll start with Simone first here. Yeah. Resistance to innovation. Can I disagree with Bonnie? Of course. It is the early stage at which there is the bottleneck. It's obvious that you're going to get the end user to look And then, therefore, you get this culture of risk taking. Oh. In the States, they're much more ready to take risks. In Europe, they're very cautious. Yeah. So they want, they want the thing to be virtually in the Amen. market before they reach into the family jewel. Yeah. So a cultural, yeah, exactly, yeah. So a very fair point, Professor Rohit. Going through, so from a cultural perspective, what's the resistor to innovation? What do we need to do? What do we need to change? So in regard to Chagas disease and also for other diseases, I think we really need awareness. And um, my experience is, for example, in Chagas, um, that is very well known in the population and they are happy yeah. that we come and test them and we create now a health point center yeah. where they can go and can get tested for free and I'm sure that will be uh, visited uh, frequently and I think but it, I think it's also it's the work of, of the um, of the big uh, pharma companies or companies like Merck or others if you have primer and probes for example to also um, make other devices available mm. which are easier, which are faster and whatever. And I think um, that is what, what is what should be done mm -hmm. to be connected and to take responsibility from all sides, mm -hmm. also from government side, what is uh, sometimes not easy to. Steph, uh, Bonnie. Yeah, uh, just to add to Bush's smiles, I think um, most people working with Bush's smiles know we don't have all the tools to to look at what we're dealing with, but I think there's this big push now on drug donation and NDA, and I think that's what people think is going to be good enough. And yeah. I think, actually, well, I, we need, there's so many questions, even with um, drug, what, what, how the drugs yeah. work and everything, but I think everybody focuses on that, and mm. um, that's, that's the to, to, to change the culture from an MDA-driven agenda to a more realistic agenda, probably the elimination phase is going to take care of that when you've got resistance issues, you've got unit costs going up for treatment, so but yeah, absolutely. Um, Rita, from an academic cultural perspective, <laughs> what needs to change um, to drive innovation? I think it's just, it's just necessary to do more research, mm. get more funding to do more research and try and find new diagnostics and new techniques. And, and, and basically, that's it. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's a fair point. I mean, maybe the open source publication kind of um, drive that everyone's experiencing, maybe that's going to catalyze more research across different disciplines that I'll, I'll put into that. But definitely. Um, I just have one thing else for this research funding thing. I think there's so much competition now to get research funding that we don't want to talk to each other about our innovative yeah. ideas because then you're losing your competitiveness. And so I think that's, you know, that's difficult as well. So. Yeah. Stefan, from your point of view, you're newly start, you're kind of a startup mode, I guess, you know, it's a new company, yeah? Well, I would say you would have to um, raise commercial awareness early on with students, very early on, and that together paired with, I completely agree with Ivan, is that um, the culture change to take a bit more risk, hmm. to make that first step into it, partner up with industry hmm. partners, and maybe some sort of um, guidance towards the very early stages, so you take away the risk and also being afraid of mm. making that very first step. The, the, mentor, that. the mentorship. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, from a, I mean, from a, I mean, that's a very fair point. So, Jim, I'll, I'll end the session with that, asking you from an industry perspective, uh, in both an industry perspective and as well as a US player, we like to take risks. How do we de-risk, you know, innovation here from your perspective? on the feasibility, that's probably the most important homework you can do. Um, both the technical feasibility, 
and then the feasibility of financially. Yes, sir. I think there's a question at the back. I'm not, I'm not reacting directly to your comment, but I just wanted to add a point to what are the bottleneck to innovation and it's something that people tend to forget, forget. A lot is that you will need policy support for any diagnostic test that you develop. Mm. And this is important to actually do that hand in hand with the product development so that when you actually are in a position to reach market, you have the policy in place. The risk otherwise is to develop a product that will never be implemented at all. Okay involve the policy people as well so i mean on that note we're going to stop because it's uh, a break you know big round of applause to each of the speakers and for sitting here for the panel thank you